Good morning, good morning. Wow. Let's open with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this time we get to spend in uh, looking at your word and help us understand what we're reading and we're understanding uh, uh, what some of these uh, uh, different verses uh, have for an outlook. As we take a look at this verse, uh, 650, I mean, uh, Genesis uh, 3.15, looks like one of your first prophecies and it, uh, it has quite uh, quite the impact. So help us to unpack Lord, and we give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. As we just went through you remember, uh, now Daniel 9.27 that we did on uh, Sunday school on Sunday, I see this verse too uh, along with that kind of an idea where it's a, it's a pivotal verse that kind of sets the stage uh, for a lot of stuff that's going to happen in the Bible. Uh, so that... Uh, Let's see, what picture? I guess we'll, we'll keep with our our picture of uh, Garden of Eden again. <clears throat> Since we're still here. And the war begins between Satan's seed and Christ, or the woman's seed. So we're going to take one verse out of Genesis, but we're going to be reading plenty of verses out of the Bible <clears throat> all over the place. And so I'll see how far we get today, but I may not even finish it today. That's how many I got. Uh, I literally probably got two days worth of verses, uh, so we'll see how far we get. <clears throat> so, here, we'll jump right in here then. And get my verses here. Okay. And here's the verse, Genesis 3.15. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head. And now she'll bruise his heel. Uh, just, just uh, we'll back up one verse just for a second, just to show you. Because it says between thy seed and her seed. So who is thy seed? And so we want to make sure of that. So we go back to verse 14, just for a second here. And the Lord God said unto the serpent. So he's talking to the serpent. So think of it from that standpoint. Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed among all cattle, and above every beast of the field, and upon the belly shall thy go. And thus shall I eat all the days of thy life. So right now, God is addressing the serpent. And we know that Satan is indwelling the serpent. <clears throat> so let's go back to verse 15. So the thee, the thy uh, uh, seed, and her seed. <clears throat> and her seed is going to be the uh, person who uh, does this de dastardly deed to Satan. And so that I uh, say it shall bruise thy head, no, it being the, her seed, will bruise thy head, and thou shall bruise his heel. And I think we know, we can already tell where this verse is going, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that at least one part of this happened in uh, 32 AD, in that time frame. Whenever I say 32 AD, I either mean somewhere around 30 AD. Uh, again, I think it's 31 AD, so I'll just say 31 AD. But basically, when Jesus Christ went to the cross is when Satan bruised his heel. <clears throat> Remember, he had a nail driven through his nail, uh, through his heel. Well, then uh, the other part of this is God is Jesus is going to bruise thy head. Uh, and so we're going to see that too. That happens in Revelation. Uh, and we'll take a look at that too. <clears throat> so the first word I want to look at here is enmity. Enmity, basically, and that's why I call this the war between these two. Enmity, that's what it means. It means the quantity, the quality of being. This is the uh, definition in the in the, uh, in the uh, dictionary. The quality of being an enemy, the opposite of friendship, ill will, hatred, unfriendly disposition, malviolence. It expresses more than aversion and less than malice, and differs from displeasure in denoting a fixed or rooted hatred. Whereas displeasure is more transient. <clears throat> so we see uh, this word used here. Uh, and then another place we see it used, the carnal mind is enmity against God. And that's something that Paul shows us over in Romans 8, 21 and 22. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. But we know that the whole worth groaneth and traileth in pain together until now. Uh, so that's the type of enmity that we have, uh, that God has between, uh, and also that the, uh, that the uh, 
the curse also applies to to the uh, creation also. <clears throat> Continuing that with that uh, definition there in enmity, the second part is called a state of opposition. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Uh, that's something that James mentions. The adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. So there's a really great uh, look at what the difference is. So this enmity is going to be between thy seed and her seed. <clears throat> so the war has begun. And <clears throat> I've checked the back of the book, We Win. Uh, so I guess I'd let you know that uh, a spoiler alert. But uh, uh, but Satan, so Satan's main drive first, we we'll start here, was he's going to try to foil God's plan. God laid out the plan right here. And he doesn't want to be uh, the bruised by the head. So he's going to do everything in his power to make this not happen. And he's going to, and some people say, well, it ended at the cross. Well, no, it didn't. Because there's still some prophecies that have to be fulfilled before the end of the world, as we went through uh, in our Daniel study, we were talking about that that uh, all the things that are happening in the tribulation are prophecies and they're, and they're things that God said has to come to pass. So those have to happen too. So if Satan can foil the uh, foil any of these plans and, and where they don't come to pass, then he gets to exist in his current state for forever and ever, or as long as, because uh, uh, basically one thing God, once he, make, once he makes a deal, he doesn't go back on it. Uh, he is about, is about as, uh, he's the one person that a handshake, uh, it's a guarantee. You don't need any signed paperwork and lawyers and stuff. When God says something, he keeps it. And Satan knows that. And Satan is using that to his advantage. That if he can if he can stop one of God's prophecies from happening, uh, then he can foil the whole plan. So you can see how good God is because he's been uh, going at it for about 6,000 years yet now. And every single prophecy that God uh, stated has come true. So I'm going to do, I'll go through a list here of how Satan, as in the past, has made attempts to cause Jesus not to be born. That's the first step. Or not have a nation of Israel to fulfill God's plan. That's the next step. Have you ever wondered why certain events have happened throughout history? Well, through time, God reveals a little more of his plan to redeem us from the curse of sin. <clears throat> and realize Satan does not have uh, the power to see the future, uh, just like God does. So... <clears throat> You kind of almost see that uh, through the Bible as you really study it and get to know it better, that God only revealed just enough information, mainly to keep Satan in the dark, uh, not to say us, like uh, this whole idea of the church, for instance. Uh, we can see hints about it in the Old Testament, but it really didn't come to pass until the New Testament. And these are, this is God kind of holding back what he could until he needed to reveal it, to keep, keep Satan in the dark, so that Satan uh, wouldn't have any foreknowledge uh, as to what uh, God's plans are. It's like the old saying, you know, when you're in the military, you don't give out your plans on how you're going to attack the enemy and let them know what you're going to do ahead of time. Uh, the, the element of surprise is a, uh, is a really good tool. So basically, go, uh, Satan's plan is to stop the prophecy of Revelation 20. So I'll show you the end. Revelation 20, verses 1 through 3. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, had the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. And cast him into the bottomless pit, and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, that he should deceive the nations no more, till the thousand years shall be fulfilled. And after that, he must be loosed a little season. So even after that, he gets one more shot. But that ends in verse 10. And then so the, after the thousand year period had gone past and the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast of the false prophet are and they shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So ultimately that is the verse that, uh, that Satan is hoping never happens. <clears throat> and he's going to do his best to try to make, stop that from happening. So here's a partial list of the, some of the things that Satan has done. And I'm sure you'll recognize a lot of them to try to foil God's plan. Well, the first one is he knows that somebody has to die for sin uh, and that somebody has to be the original perpetrator, has to be in the line of Adam. And so he's got to make sure that the line going from Adam all the way to uh, to the person who's going to redeem 
is pure. And so the first thing he's going to do is going to try to kill the children from Adam. So what's the first thing he does? We're going to talk about this when we get into chapter 4. Uh, Cain kills Abel. And we see that in Genesis 4, 8. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So that was the first attempt. Now, the second one is a famous one that I really love. I studied a lot. And when we get to that one, we'll, we'll have a fun uh, lesson on this. That's Genesis 6 and uh, the prelude to the flood and why God had to do the flood. That's in Genesis 6, 1 through 8. <clears throat> and it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born unto them. The sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants in the earth in those days and after those days, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they would bear children to them. This is like a uh, the corrupting the seed. And this is what uh, I want to really strive on is that uh, I see Satan using and trying to corrupt the seed at this point all through uh, through this period so that uh, that the person that, uh, that Jesus can't be born of a pure seed all the way back to Adam. So here's Satan is trying to corrupt the seed by sending some of his fallen angels down to have uh, to mate with uh, uh, earthly women. And so they're no longer, uh, <clears throat> that's where the, uh, the daughters are the sons of God as a reference to angels. And so these are fallen angels come to the daughters of men and they bear children to them. The same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. <clears throat> and it repented the Lord that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him at his heart. The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creepy thing and the fowls of the air, for it replenish, repenteth me that I have made them. <clears throat> but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, uh, so that there were, there were eight people that were not corrupted by this... Uh, uh, this thing Satan tried to pull off, and uh, and so he's going to use that to repopulate the earth. But first, he's got to get rid of that whole all that gene pool problem. This is what I believe. There's others that believe differently, uh, but uh, I'm not I'm not alone in my beliefs either. There's, there's quite a few people that uh, also believe like I do. Okay, the next one is uh. Now we get to the point where uh, remember Moses. Uh, we have uh, the other the other part that Satan tries to do is that, is that Jesus has to be born out of the nation of Israel, and we know a nation of Israel was born with uh, 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 Jacob through the twelve tribes of Israel that went into that were in uh, Egypt, and they were slaves. And we know that uh, that uh, pretty much the whole nation was there. And we know that Jesus has to be born out of the nation of Israel, and so this is the next attempt that, that, that Satan did. He, t he convinced Pharaoh to throw all the male babies into the river. But one got saved, a man by the name of Moses. We see that in Exodus 1.22. And Pharaoh charged all his people, saying, Every son that is born ye shall cast into the river, and every daughter ye shall save alive. Jump into verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 10. And the child grew, and she brought him into Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. And she called his name Moses. And she said, Because I drew him out of the water. Well, here we have uh, one man that's going to save his nation, Israel. <laughs> Ultimately, it won't be for a good 80 years from this point, but that's what's going to happen. But you see Moses got saved out of those people, those boys being thrown into the river. The next attempt was uh, the Red Sea. Now, here we have an entire nation of Israel. Uh, it's in front of the Red Sea, and Pharaoh's army is coming up behind them. That's in Exodus 14. Uh, 7 through 10, and then 16 through 17, I'm going, what I'm going to read. <clears throat> and he took 600 chosen chariots, and all the chariots of Egypt, and captains, every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued after the children of Israel, and the children of Israel went out with a high hand. But the Egyptians pursued after him all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, and his army, and overtook them, camping by the sea beside Pirata before Baal Zephon. 
And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and beheld the Egyptians marched after them. And they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. I jumped down. Now I'm going to jump down to verse 16 and 17. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I behold, and I will, and will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts, upon his chariots and upon his horsemen. In other words, basically, uh, that once the children of God had gotten through the Red Sea, God allowed the, the waters to collapse onto the uh, onto the uh, uh, Pharaoh's army, and they killed them all. I love the I love the the, the basic concept here. They say, well. They went through a place they call the uh, the area of the reeds. Uh, it's very shallow water, uh, so that they just uh, you know uh, it sounds like a really big deal, but the water wasn't very deep, so they got th they just kind of waded through the water. Well, the other aspect of that is then then the entire Pharaoh's army was drowned in a few inches of water. Uh, so I like how God made it so that it was impossible for people to come up with another theory. Okay, the next one, if you were in on a study with Esther, you remember there, too, uh, the good old Haman. Right? He wanted to try to destroy all the uh, Israelites. And that's another attempt by Ham uh, by, uh, by uh, Satan to eliminate all the Jews. And so we remember that from Esther. And we'll read a few verses there in Esther 3, 8 through 10. And Haman said unto King Xerxes, There was a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of the kingdom, and all the laws are diverse from all people. Neither keep they that king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. Basically, Haman was trying to convince the king that they weren't keeping the laws of Persia, and so that they should be killed, which is a lie. Uh, they, were, they weren't. They, were, they, they believed in, uh, in honoring their God, that's true, but they... Uh, the, they were pretty uh, law-abiding people on the most part. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business to bring it to the king's treasuries. So he's given a little bribe here to the king to, to get this to happen. Haman never liked, if you remember the story, uh, Haman never liked a certain man by the name of Mordecai. Mordecai was a Jew, but he was well favored by the court. And he had a niece in the name of Esther, uh, who ended up becoming favored by the by the uh, by the king, and she ended up uh, again married to him. Kind of interesting how God works sometimes. He put Esther in the right place at the right time. Verse ten. And the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to Haman, the son of uh, Agagite, the Agatite, the Jew's enemy. So this is where uh, Haman was actually going to go try to have all the Jews killed, and he pretty much succeeded until the Esther found out about his plot. And then so she goes to try to, to, to uh, upset it, and she's successful. And we see that in Esther 9, uh, verse 12 through 14. And the king said unto Esther the queen, The Jews have slain and destroyed 500 men in Shushan, in the palace. And the ten sons of Haman, what have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now what is thy petition, and it shall be granted thee? Or what is thy request further, and it shall be done? The king has already uh, eliminated a lot of the uh, the uh, people trying to kill the Jews, but he's asking her what she wants him to do with the ten sons of this man, Haman. And Esther's answer is, kill him. And said, so, Esther, if it please the king, let it be granted to the Jews which are in Shushan, to do tomorrow as according to unto this day's decree, and let Haman's ten sons be hanged upon the gallows. And the king commanded that it so be done, and the decree was given at Shushan, and they hanged Haman's ten sons. So that was the uh, that plot was uh, was taken out of the way. And every step of the way, God was putting somebody in place ahead of time to make sure that uh, that uh, that Satan's man was not going to be successful. So now we move into the New Testament, <clears throat> and over in Matthew, now we have Jesus uh, just got born. Okay, so Satan says, oh, well, I got, uh, I, did, I wasn't successful in stopping him from being born. Now what am I going to do? Well, he's going to try something else. So he convinces his man, uh, Herod, uh, that he wants to, uh, to kill all the babies 
uh, which, which hopefully will include Jesus. I realize we know that Jesus has to die. But Jesus has to die at a certain day, on a certain time, after fulfilling certain requirements. Plus, uh, he needed to, uh, to bring the gospel to the, uh, to the kingdom and teach us about the gospel. So he not only was going to uh, going to die for our sins, but he also brought in the uh, uh, basically brought in the New Testament and the Gospels. So let's take a look at that. Uh, the first attempt is over in Matthew two sixteen and through eighteen. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And Ramah was there, a voice heard lamentations and weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they are not. You know, there was a pretty bad tragedy with all the kids that weren't uh, protected. But that uh, uh, prior to this incident, uh, God had talked to uh, Joseph and Mary and told them to uh, escape uh, into Egypt. We see that in verses 13 through 15. And when they were departed, behold, the angel Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take the young child and his mother and flee into Egypt and be there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. And it was there until the death of Herod that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of by the Lord, by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. So two things happened there. Uh, he protected Jesus from being killed, and he also uh, fulfilled a prophecy uh, that uh, Jesus had to spend a little time in Egypt. He did it as a baby. <clears throat> okay, so the next attempt was a direct attempt. Uh, Satan is going to try to uh, tempt Jesus himself into uh, bypassing the cross uh, and just start to worry and that, and that uh, Satan is going to give him all the uh, nations of the world uh, if he just bows down to Satan. Sounds like a pretty yeah, easy deal, but that's not the way it's going to, that's not the way it should be because remember, Jesus is God. So basically, if he bows down to Satan, uh, he's given into him and uh, and he may end up with the world, but he's not going to, basically, it's going to be uh, not a very pleasant uh, existence. But Satan is going to try. So it's the temptation in the wilderness. And we see that in Matthew 4. I'll just read a couple of verses. Then was Jesus led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. Jumping down to verse 8. And the, again, the devil taketh him up into exceedingly high mountain and show of him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to them, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. <clears throat> Temptation. And I know probably there's a lot of people in this world that would take that, take Satan up on that offer. But of course, Jesus, uh, I think Jesus said to him, get thee hence be uh, Satan. Uh, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thy serve. Two things to point out here is that, uh, one, uh, Satan used, uh, uh, that Satan did have control of the earth, and he still does. <clears throat> and so he was able to actually offer this. And that Jesus also lets us know, used actually uh, scripture uh, to counteract uh, Satan's uh, attack. And that's a good uh, uh example of how we can uh, push back against Satan, I guess is the best word. And that's where Ephesians 6 comes in, the whole armor of God. Okay, and then the next time, the next attempt is uh, the famous storm at sea. And I think after I read this, you ought to understand that uh, these were seasoned fishermen in this boat. Uh, they have been they have been on these seas all of their lives fishing, and there's no way that a simple they they're used to the kind of storms that were on on the uh, Sea of Galilee, and so most people believe that this sea this particular storm was a lot worse than a normal storm, and it was Satan's attempt to try to kill Jesus Jesus early. We see this in Luke eight twenty two through twenty five. Now it came to pass on a certain day that he went into a ship with his disciples. 
And he said unto them, Let us go over unto the other side of the lake. And they launched forth. But as they sailed, he fell asleep, and there came down a storm of wind on the lake, and they were filled with water and were in jeopardy. And they came to him and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased, and there was a calm. And he said unto them, Where is thy faith? And they, being afraid, wondered, saying to one another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. And most people believe that was an attempt, another attempt by Satan to try to kill Jesus before his time. And then there was another time in uh, Nazareth uh, that uh, he was almost stoned to death. Oh, no, he was almost thrown off a cliff. Let me show you this one. Luke 4, 16 through 22. <clears throat> And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of uh, the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And this is an actual prophecy that Jesus is fulfilling right here and now. And he's going to point that out. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted to preach deliverance to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. He set at liberty them that are bruised. So this is, this is the reason he came this first time. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Well, at that point, uh, Jesus did not finish that statement. That's a statement of Isaiah. And I didn't, I didn't bring the verse up. I think it's Isaiah 61, if I remember correctly. I can look real quick. But there's one, there's one, there's part of that verse that he did not finish. Yeah, here it is, 61. Let me just throw it in here so you can see it. So here it is in Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord, God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And the opening of the prison to them that are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. But he stopped there. And he just, uh, and, he, and, he, and we're going to see here, he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the uh, attendant. But there's one verse he did not say, of the, part of that verse. And that's going to happen in Revelation. And that, ver and that part he missed was, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all them that mourn. So that, uh, he did not say that part because he was not there to do that part then. So back to back to that uh, what we were just talking about. They began to say to them, "This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears." And all bear him witness and wondered at the uh, gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, "Is not this Joseph's son?" Now I'm going to jump down to verse 28. And all they in the synagogue, when they had heard these things, were filled with wrath. And he rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him unto the brow of the hill whereupon the city was built. They might cast him down headlong. But he passed through the midst of them and went on his way. I think he kind of basically turned into a uh, spirit and kind of just floated through them. They, 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 they couldn't see him. It became invisible. I believe one power that uh, uh, we will have once we have our new bodies is somehow be able to uh, move through time. <clears throat> and we see that a lot when we get into Jesus after the uh, crucifixion, when he would show up here and show up there, and uh, he'd walk through uh, solid brick walls and and uh, and have that kind of ability. And I think that's an ability where you can basically go into another dimension and, and actually move between places by, uh, by met, uh, like, a, like a, if you ever watch Star Trek, a little bit like the uh, transporter uh, kind of idea. I have a feeling we're going to be able to do that once we get our our good our new bodies. Okay, so uh, rejection in Nazareth. So I think I might stop there before we move into the next section. Let me see how much more I got. I'm only about halfway through my verses. We're already at thirty minutes. So this is a good spot stopping spot. We're going to get into uh, uh, 
some prophecies that I believe start here and go on into the, uh, uh, and it's a little bit of what we were talking about uh, in, uh, in Daniel 2.43. And so I think I will stop here and we will finish the rest tomorrow. But basically we saw all the ways that, G that Satan tried to have him killed. And now we're going to see what Satan is going to do into the future uh, and try to fort the ability for, because uh, Jesus fulfilled all the things he needed to fulfill up to his uh, death, burial, and resurrection. But now uh, there's still a future prophecies that need to be fulfilled. We're going to touch base on a few of those. And so I just want to kind of give a really cool timeline of why uh, that verse that was proclaimed by God uh, is basically what is what is what we're living through uh, even now. Uh, it's been it's been over six thousand years now, uh, pretty much. We don't know exactly. We know approximately. And so uh, we'll end there and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, oh Lord, praise you and thank you so much for all this, uh, uh, all these prophecies, Lord. It's just it's really interesting to see the timeline as we see based on your prophecies. And uh, I know I personally find it very uh, satisfying to get a, a glimpse into your your thoughts and that uh, we get to get to know you a little bit better and on, uh, on what you what your plan is. And we praise you and thank you so much for letting us know. And we look forward to that day that we get to uh, enjoy uh, being with you and serving you. And that, uh, can't wait for that to happen, Lord. Uh, Maranatha and praise you, Lord, and thank you so much for all you do. In Jesus name I pray. Amen. Maranatha, Lord, come quickly. Uh, it, uh, there used to be an old joke that they used to go around, particularly in the 70s and 80s when I was growing up, uh, because Star Trek, I mean, Star Wars, no, Star Trek was a really popular show then. And it was, uh, uh, Scotty, beam me up. There's no intelligent life down here. Well, uh, that's uh, uh, kind of the way I'm feeling now. Uh, Lord, beam us up. Uh, there's no, uh, this world is getting worse and worse at, uh, as time goes on. And so we'll talk again tomorrow and we'll finish up this idea of the uh, of how Satan is trying to fort God's plan. So have a good day and we'll talk to you tomorrow.